pretty much been or considered myself an astrobiologist my whole professional career from the, the day I started graduate school. So before I was an astrobiologist, I was an undergrad physics major that dreamed of working at Fermilab and you know finding some of the fundamental particles that everything is made of. But and I grew up from in Chicago. That's that's the reason I focused on Fermilab. But I quickly gravitated towards astrobiology for a couple reasons. One is that top level question. I just, I love the question of are we alone? And so my whole career has been in pursuit of that. And the other part of it was, I really enjoyed the fact that an interdisciplinary science like astrobiology requires us to interact with each other. And so it draws to the field a bunch of people who like interacting with other people. And I like being in that kind of environment. It's nice on the day to day to be around other human beings that want to talk to me, um, which you don't always get in science. And, and it's something I really appreciate about astrobiology. You know, we all have our detailed questions that we get focused on, but the thing about astrobiology is it draws you up from those detailed questions you work on in your, in your research and in your papers, and it gets you talking to people from totally different fields, whether it's by, I'm a, I'm a geologist by training, other, you know, astrobiology and geology. But I talk to physicists, I talk to astronomers, I talk to biologists and chemists. Now that we're having an influence on missions at NASA, I talk to engineers all the time. Um, and, and, and so I, and I, I enjoy that. I, I, I really appreciate representing the science I do to people that are smart enough to understand it and interested in it, but aren't the people I'm competing with or collaborating with on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of the detailed research questions I look at. Now, in terms of the transition, I, because I was interested in astrobiology, I sought out a graduate program that had that as part of its, part of its core curriculum. So I went to Penn State, and the, and the reason I did is they had, actually at the time, they were the only place in the country that offered a PhD in astrobiology. I think there are two places that do that now, Penn State and the University of Washington. But for me, I, I, I sought out astrobiology. I, you know, it didn't sort of come to me later on in, in my career. It's something I wanted to do from the outset. And so I found the places that would, that would help me become a, a, a bona fide, you know, degree-carrying astrobiologist. That's, that's something I set out to do from the start. So for me, I found out about it from a couple popular science books. I, I read a lot of books when I was in high school and college that were just popular science. And, and a lot of the ones that I really enjoyed were about astrobiology. And I think if I were to give advice to any of the students coming up or anyone that's thinking about a career in science, it would be to find that, to find something you love. And, and, and for me, it was the search for life. But I think if you're interested in astrobiology, there's a second component to that, which is, you know, I said I went to school in astrobiology, but I went really to school in a geology department that gave me a degree in both geology and astrobiology. And so really, if you want to be an astrobiologist, you need to love the search for life, but you also need to find some disciplinary question, some, you know, area of research that you can apply to astrobiology. And you have to love that as well. And that's important because everything in life is competitive these days. Even if it's not competitive in the mean-spirited sense, it's competitive in the sense of two people, you know, gunning for a starting position on a sports team. There's a limited number of, of positions of open in the field. There's a limited amount of funding in the field. And that means you have to work really, really hard to be successful. Even if you're extraordinarily smart, you still have to work extremely hard. And that's a lot easier to do if you love what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. So my advice to anyone that's considering astrobiology or any other science, any career in general is find something you love because it's gonna be harder to, it's gonna be easier to work hard to pursue the, the things you're passionate about. So when I first started out, I worked in a, in a lab that looked at rocks from the ancient most parts of Earth, we call the Archean Earth. And we were looking at specific isotopes of iron in those rocks, basically different flavors of iron that have different masses, to see if we could tease out the conditions that were present on early Earth. So that's relevant to astrobiology because this period of Earth I, I refer to as the most alien planet for which we have data. Everything was different about the planet back then. Now, I don't do that stuff anymore. I, I almost never go into a lab unless it's a tour of someone else's lab. And the reason for that is, frankly, I'm a really bad lab scientist, right? If you put me in there with a bunch of chemicals, I know I'm klutzy. I know I'm bound to spill a bunch of stuff. Um, and so I, I had to find a different path. And, and, and I eventually found my way into labs that did simulations, that, that, that modeled the data either that we've uncovered from ancient Earth, or now I'm working on simulating the data 
that we're uncovering from the Mars rovers and the Mars orbiters and from the telescopes we'd like to build to one day look for life on other worlds. So there's a second aspect of it, which is you have to find something you love to do, but then you have to find something related to that thing you love that you're actually good at. And for me, I, I knew I was not very good at lab work, so I had to find something else that I was that leveraged my skills. And turns out I'm a, I'm a pretty good programmer, and so that was that was a place I could do astrobiology and leverage skill sets that I had. For me, it was not a big deal to switch between a couple things, but they were at sort of natural transition points. You know, I've when as you go through your career from an undergraduate student to a graduate student to a postdoc, maybe to a second postdoc, and eventually to a permanent position, every one of those career changes is an opportunity for you to pivot and put a slightly different direction to, to where you're heading. And so for me, I, I was a lab scientist as an undergraduate and as a master's student, and I realized that I was not that great at that. And so when I went and got my PhD, when I entered uh, the, the PhD program, I found a way to pivot to being a modeler and, and not have to be in the lab so much anymore. And then I've since, since I got hired at Goddard, I've pivoted again and now I'm working on mission design and mission development and I'm working with engineers all the time. And so I, every time you have a career change with a new position, it, it, it's an opportunity. Even if you don't leave the field, you can change what part of the field you're having an impact on and what, what your day-to-day -day life is like in terms of what kind of work you're doing. I really enjoy working in team-based environments and so, you know, if you really like not doing that, if you like going off on your own and doing some detailed question and not being bothered by other people, you can be successful in astrobiology, but you might be happier in another discipline where you can do that stuff and aren't expected to, to interact with other people. Um, on the other hand, if you're like me and you really like interacting with other people, astrobiology is great because not only are people asking you to do that, but you're going to be more successful because of your ability to do that uh, by developing the skills to do that. And, and the, the things you are required to do to be successful are just going to be more enjoyable on your daily, da in your daily experience. Um, and, and for me, I really like stepping into rooms and into conversations where I don't know a large part of what's going on. You know, a lot of astrobiologists, especially senior scientists, that are used to being the expert in everything that they ever discuss, can be uncomfortable when they're put in a situation where a large part of the conversation is a bit foreign to them. For me, I relish that. I, I, I think that's such a, a great place to learn new things and to broaden my education in a way that my formal background as a geologist and previously as a physicist never would have done. And I know more things about biology and chemistry and engineering than I ever would know just based on the interactions I've had with other human beings that are my colleagues and the people that I work with. And, and for me, that's, it, it keeps things fresh, for lack of a better word. It makes it so that the things I know today and I need to know today are totally different from the things I'm going to need to know five years from now. And that means that five years from now, this is all going to still feel really new and exciting and adventurous. And I, I, I really love that. It, for me, that, that, is, that is a huge part of why I love my job as an astrobiologist. So I, I do think it's important to specialize. I think, you know, every good scientist is the, one of the world's few experts in some tiny corner of knowledge. But, but the question is, where do you build the web that, that that bit of knowledge is connected to? Do you just build it to the people that would normally be housed in the same department and in the same physical building on a university campus? Or do you build that network out to other disciplines and other buildings on campus, or maybe even other campuses or other kinds of institutions? And it, it's, that, it's that second part of it. it. It's not, you know, whether or not you need to have some detailed expertise. It's how you connect the thread of that expertise to other areas of knowledge. And so what, for me, what that meant is I honestly took a little bit of flack when I was a graduate student and I would ditch colloquiums that frankly weren't really relevant to the big picture questions I wanted to be pursuing. Um, but instead of going to those, I was making time to maybe go to a biology lecture or a chemistry lecture outside of the geology department I was in. Yeah, th there's no doubt that any collaborative endeavor, and astrobiology is absolutely no exception, every collaborative endeavor requires you to be an active collaborator. Um, this, this doesn't work if all you do is go to a bunch of lectures and sit back 
and just you know try to absorb it, right? And it actually doesn't work if you also just go to lectures and just tell the audience what they want to hear. Um, it, it only works if the conversations you're having are, are more than just two directional. They need to be happening with broader people throughout a room. Um, and I actually think that the best successes that we've had in astrobiology come when we're actively fostering these multi-directional conversations between all these different, different disciplines. Um, but that, that requires you to be active. You have to be a participant in a conversation um, as opposed to just someone that's receiving or delivering knowledge to another person. Um, in terms of how you build your network, it also requires you to be active in that res regard. Um, it means that when you have opportunities to go to conferences that could expand your network across disciplines, that, that you should take those opportunities. I think we're, I, I was very fortunate to be amongst the first generation of astrobiology students that went to things like the Astrobiology Grad Conference, the AbGradCon. That was a place where I got to know people on a personal level there who are, were and still are my friends um, that, that are part of my professional collaborative network now as well. And having those opportunities where you can build really strong relationships with other humans whose knowledge is critical to your, to your success, is, it's a big part of this. So, you know, the active part is to search out those opportunities and then when you're in those environments, be an active participant in the conversations that are going on. Those, are, those two things are both important. I want to emphasize how important AbGradCon is to this, this whole endeavor. We thrive on the ability of our science community to work together and to work together amicably so that if we have a disagreement about something we can work it out. It also means that we have to be really efficient at exchanging knowledge between these different fields. We can't get too tied down in jargon or else those, those lines of communication aren't going to work. And the brain is a funny thing, you know, it, it, if, you, if you try to train human brains to communicate certain ways too late in life or too far after they've been trained as scientists, it becomes harder to break down communication barriers that get stood up because we rely on jargon. We get trained to rely on jargon. We get trained to communicate in specific ways to our specific disciplines. And AbGradCon is a way to train us as astrobiologists to communicate in a, in a first order way before those habits are set. Um, and, and at the same time, you're, you're just developing these wonderful personal relationships with people that are going to be hopefully colleagues for the rest of your career. So there's two aspects of it. First, you're, you're learning how to communicate in a way that your, your home department might not train you to communicate and that, you're, that is going to be a professional tool that you're going you're gonna to be able to use later in your career, even if you're not an astrobiologist, because even if you don't do any astrobiology research, even if you aren't a scientist at all, that ability to communicate to other intelligent, knowledgeable human beings about what you care about is so critical to success. And in addition to that, it, it is the first steps of developing a career-long network of people that, that are going to help you do your work. So one of the things that is different from my job as a NASA civil servant versus someone that's a professor at a university, well, let me start by talking about what's similar. First of all, I have something that's kind of like tenure. I have job security just like many tenured faculty do. I do a lot of research just like a lot of tenured faculty do. Um, I write proposals and I'm part uh, co-I or PI on proposals to get a research team together of graduate students and postdocs and I get to advise students just like university faculty do. Those things are relatively similar and so if you view yourself as a researcher and someone that wants to do that, NASA, other national labs are pathways to doing that that, that aren't the exact same thing as a university tenured faculty member. Now what's different is uh, the other stuff outside the research is, is totally different from what I would have at a university. If I was a faculty member, I'd have a lot of teaching responsibilities. Uh, my advising responsibilities would be more formalized, whereas at NASA they're kind of like added on to the things I'm required to do. At NASA I'm required to help the agency put together a science plan and then carry that out through spaceflight missions. So I get involved in things like the Mars Curiosity rover. I get involved in our design of future telescopes that would look for life on other worlds. And, and in, in that role, I'm interfacing with engineers, I'm interfacing with people that manage budgets and, and, and do programmatics um, to figure out how these things would actually get done, or, or in the cases of the ones that are flying or, in, or, or that have landed on Mars already, to think about what the next steps are going to be after that, after that mission's flown, or with the engineers that are running the instrumentation on the fly. Um, and so it's a different group of people I'm interacting with. Um, I, I actually think both are great career paths. 
And my advice is, you know, because there are so many PhDs being produced every year, that if you're a graduate student or if you're thinking about going to graduate school in astrobiology or any other area of, of science, you have to keep your options as open as possible. So if you want to do research, you should look at all the different kinds of institutions that will allow you to do that. If you're interested in teaching, you should look at all the different kinds of institutions that would allow you to do that. And so, you know, for, for me, I was really passionate about research. I was really passionate about the missions. I happen to also be very passionate about teaching as well. There's no way one human being can do all those things. So I, I, I left myself open to applying for faculty positions, uh, civil servant positions. I actually realized the astronaut, astronaut corps wasn't that much more competitive than some of the faculty positions that are out there in terms of how many applicants it get. So I actually applied to the astronaut corps. Um, and, and eventually the, the one that came through for me was the civil servant job, the, the job I have at NASA Goddard. And I, and I absolutely love it there. I wish they had better public transit access to campus, but everything else about my job at Goddard, I absolutely love.